I told my mother, my whole squad was Catholic. She writes me a letter, said, make sure every one of them gets a confession. <laughs> make sure they get the mass again. If something would happen to one of them, that would be on your soul. I went, I got enough problems keeping them alive, let alone worrying about their soul. I'd been in Vietnam about two and a half months, and I was on Operation Baxter Garden. I carried the radio then. My radio didn't work, and they told me to stay there until I got my radio fixed. The chopper was coming in, and I was hoping they had a new handset, and my handset was bad. A radio man there said, this can't be fixed. And so I seen my, my unit going off, way off. And I couldn't stay. So I ran to catch up with them. And I caught them right before they went into a, this fortified village. And my squad leader asked me, so what, what's going on with the radio? I said, it can't be fixed. We went into the village, a firefight broke out. We were heavily engaged and my squad leader said he was gonna go around and flank them. He said, give me your weapon, Willie. Take mine and get it unjammed. So I got the rifle unjammed I was trying to give him cover and he ran into some bushes in front of us and he got hit and he said, they're killing me. And the next day I got wounded. And uh, I got wounded by a command detonated mine and a, I think a Chai Con grenade then too. Rick was sent back to the States and recovered from his shrapnel wounds at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Because Rick had been given a top security clearance out of radio and sniper school, he was reassigned to Marine Corps headquarters in Washington, D.C. I was trained as a mechanic, so I ended up carrying a rifle. And, and so Washington was for well-educated people. I wasn't, I felt out of place. I, I'm a mud Marine and I felt like I was doing something wrong being there. And so I, I volunteered to go back to Vietnam. and. Uh, go back into the infantry. Da Nang Airfield was a very active air base. We were an intelligence unit focused on the north. We supported the air operations. So we were flying reconnaissance aircraft. We were conducting airstrikes as well. There are also ground operations up there in, involving special operations forces. We were security for the Greater Dane complex there. And uh, there was a lot of valuable assets there. There was the planes, there was radar. Then they said the one area over here, and they said is some kind of intelligence area. And our gunnery sergeant told us, if the gooks get past you, you better be dead. In November of 70, we were providing intelligence support on a special ops raid on a camp called Sante, which was west of Hanoi, in an attempt to bring home all the POWs at that camp. It was a huge air effort. When our forces went in to uh, the Sante area, um, there was nobody there. Were we that far off the mark? I don't think we were. I suspect that the North Vietnamese knew that we were coming. I think the United States demonstrated a very strong will and commitment to bring people home. This unlikely pair, Rick, the mechanic turned Marine from Springfield, Ohio, and Tony, the commissioned Air Force officer from St. Paul, Minnesota, both served in Vietnam at the same time, in the same place, but did not know each other. Incredibly, it took a random meeting on a tennis court to discover that their lives intersected quite profoundly 47 years ago. I started playing tennis and I met a man named Tony Jensen. And somehow come up, we were both in Vietnam and he said he was at Da Nang and I said I was at Da Nang. He mentioned that he was a retired Marine. So we just, we kind of, start talking about, oh, where were you assigned? And when were you assigned? So we found out that we were at Da Nang together. 
the same time period. Come to find out he was that guy. One of the guys I was guarding, they said, well, if anybody gets past us, you better be dead. It's almost like now I, I, I almost like I look after him. <laughs> I look, you know, and I did that then, you know. And he, uh, he uh, watches out for me. And we uh, sort of worry about each other. The question is, is it purely coincidence? I tend to think that it's something more than that. Into the city? Yeah, I never went in the city. I can't tell you kind of how deep the feelings may run because I personally feel that if it wasn't for Rick and, <laughs> and uh, his man, um, I probably wouldn't be here today. We became very close friends. And uh, I was at the bottom of the food chain. He was at the top of the food chain, <laughs> so to speak. And he, uh, he's a class act. And, so I'm very thankful he's my friend. You create a bond with people. And the bond uh, never ends. It was especially delightful to find out that I had a bond with somebody that I didn't know. <laughs> and I didn't know when it began. So uh, in some ways, maybe we're making up for lost time.